was actually out here in the Valley from 9903 with Intel Capital when I did a lot of enterprise software investing, some of the early uh, consumer web, uh, and then uh, moved back east um, and was with a couple funds there. Uh, one is uh, New Venture Partners, which uh, commercialized technology out of corporate labs. So uh, went into labs and um, like IBM, Philips, British Telecom, um, uh, Intel, and would go in and look at orphaned technology. Um, you know, a lot of these corporates at least used to have these huge research organizations, but wouldn't necessarily commercialize it all on their own. And um, so this fund was created to um, incubate and, and kind of create business plans around some of this technology. So very much acted as, as co-founders with the technologists and we'd incubate for six to 12 months internally and then make an assessment on whether to, um, uh, to spin out and get other funding. Um, and, and then after that, I was with uh, the New York City Investment Fund. Oh, <laughs> it's yeah. probably feeling like you are, you know, like I don't want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's with the, in the New York City Investment Fund, which is, um, is an economic development fund started by Henry Kravis, um, who uh, was one of the founders of KKR, uh, and Steve Schwartzman and, and Barry Diller. And um, I ran the venture investments there, um, it, which kind of fed the, the returns for some of the lower return, like true economic development work that we did. Um, so, um, and, and part of the mandate, <laughs> a part of the mandate there was, uh, oh, that's like a purple filter. Yeah, really? It's like an Instagram Yeah, it's an Instagram slide. Okay, part of the mandate of the New York City Investment Fund was um, uh, to seed the ecosystem there, and, and we're seeing uh, you know, a lot of that around the world. I was just in Jordan um, talking about that and meeting with, I actually met with the king there, and, and um, mentioned the president of Poland is also very interested in technology, and you know, I think it's something we're seeing all around the world. But from, so in, um, from 20, 2007 to 2010, I, I, was, um, I started a seed fund in New York. I did some direct investing. Kind of created liaisons between the Bloomberg administration and the VC community and the universities, which are all you know, very important components of building an ecosystem there. And now it's you know thriving. It's rival, rival, rivaling Silicon Valley. You know, it's um, they're actually New York is the only region that's actually seen more venture investing over like the last few years, um, and the only one in, in, in the U.S. Um, so, so it's been very successful, some of the things we put in place there. Um, and, and after you know, being in the industry for a while, seeing several cycles, um, I decided to start a fund uh, for some of the gaps that I see out there um, in, in the VC space. And one of the big ones is a global outlook. Um, I, I was born in Nairobi. I'm Indian. I grew up you know, going to the emerging markets. Um, and uh, have been investing. You know, when I was at Intel, I did um, one of Intel's largest deals in India that later I PO'd. Um, and, and so I just think there's tremendous potential. And so part of the fund will be investing in non US startups, but also help US startups access some of these markets. Sorry? What's the problem? We, we have somebody had a, another, somebody had another one. Another yeah. one, yeah. yeah the, the one that was there originally didn't work. But thanks for the I'm not sure now. Sorry about this one. Okay. No problem. Um, and uh, so anyway, so that that will lead me into the presentation. Um, and I, you know, we have a very international crew here, so I you know I want to keep this interactive too, and, and get your thoughts as um, you know we move through this presentation. But uh, you know, the concept is that there's you know Silicon Valley no longer has a monopoly on innovation, um, and I mean it never really did, but now we have connectivity and, and the ability to, to find startups you know, all over the world um, that are addressing not only local markets, but, um, but can access you know, markets beyond their borders. Um, 
So I think this is a very exciting time to be investing, and um, and I personally would like to see more diversity, you know, amongst investors, uh, more global outlook, and that's one of the reasons that uh, I'm starting this fund. So, um, I mean, I talked about this a little bit. Um, uh, Silicon Valley is where it used to be at, and, and now you know we're seeing certain ecosystems around the world that are innovating or leapfrogging Silicon Valley. And, you know, this woman in Africa with a mobile phone, and I, I spent a lot of time in Africa. I, I, I didn't mention in my introduction I was also with Omidyar Network um, in, in 2010 for a year, helping them uh, put together their mobile strategy and investing in emerging markets. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I was spent a lot of time in East Africa, um, India, I uh, did a deal in Mexico, was in Brazil, uh, and, and really saw the potential um, uh, when I was doing that. Um, so, and, and then I'm going to just go through three sectors that I think um, are particularly interesting globally. You know, there's innovation happening in different countries um, in e-money, e-commerce, and healthcare, and by no means are, you know, is it limited to these three, but these are the ones that I see as being you know, universally growing um, across all of these, um, these geographies that we're going to talk about. So the world, um, the world population. I mean, the, you know, the gist of this, um, this uh, slide is that uh, we know that China and India you know, have these huge populations Right now, you know, U.S. is third, Indonesia is fourth, um, and then Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nigeria, Russia, and Japan. The forecast for 2050 is that India is going to overtake China and um, overall population China because of the one-child uh, 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 mandate that they had for so many years is actually going to have um, an aging population um, in, in the future. So not just because I'm Indian, but I think India is, is a, a tremendous market with a lot of potential, just given um, you know, a lot of factors. I mean, one is the growth, uh, and it, it's uh, also a primarily an English language market, or you know, that, that's a national, that's one of the national languages along with Hindi. Um, but you can see that, um, so the, the top four stay the same, but you have Nigeria coming in, you know, in the fifth position. Um, and then you also see Brazil appearing on this. Um, and, uh, and then you can see, I mean, we'll get to this, but uh, both Russia and Japan are going to be losing population. And I know we have some, uh, you know, Russian, <laughs> Russian in, the, in the house, but uh, so it, it's, you know, I, I think for some of those places, there, um, and I'd say especially Russia, right, is known for a lot of technical talent, can it's actually innovate. <laughs> innovate <laughs> Uh, but, uh, you know, innovate for, for global markets. Um, so, uh, I don't know how easy this is to read on the screen, but so population growth, and this goes with what we were saying before, the, the, the red areas are going to have the most population growth, um, you know, the next 50 years. Um, the dark green areas, so most of them are in Africa, are next. And then, uh, you know, the ones that pay attention to are Europe, um, you know, Russia, as I mentioned, uh, which are going to have negative population growth. Um, this is just to get a sense of where, you know, the bulk of the population is going to be, the bulk of the consumers um, down the road. Is there going to be a, an issue in China with, with the fact that they kill so many girl babies? Because I just noticed in the valley there's so many male Chinese PhD students. Right. But Ne hardly ever see women, and I thought, gee, it must be like a lonely sort of place. <laughs> yeah, yes, in China, yeah, because yeah. they got rid of so many girls. But but what's been in, <laughs> yeah, and and you know their implications for merit. Yeah, yeah they have to they have to go to right. uh, Hong so, Kong and Taiwan yeah. to get women and sort right. of things. Right, yeah. So there, there's definitely been issues around that. But then I've also noticed that the women are actually uh, very much equals. They're the ones that survived, <laughs> you know, it, it's, um, and, and that's, you know, I have to say also when I was just in Jordan, which, you know, I didn't expect that there were at least as many women entrepreneurs in every room as, right. as there were men. Right. And that's just not something you see yeah. in the U.S. Yeah, exactly. Good work. 
And um, then the median age is also uh, you know, something to pay attention to as we look at future uh, uh, you know, workforce and, and growth in consumers. And, and you know, Africa um, is, is a youthful population. Uh, they range from uh, 14 to 20. So the dark green, uh, which is here, is, is the 14 to 20. And then, uh, and then we work our way up. Um, I mean, India, you know, India is kind of in the middle, um, but you can see that um, the U.S. is, is aging, and um, as, as is China, as is Russia. Um, then GDP growth, um, this follows very much along the lines of, you know, the, the, the overall population growth. Um, but we see slowing, and, and this is, these are, you know, this is from 2011, I'd say that the statistics in Europe are probably much more dire at this point. But, um, you know, we're seeing India uh, and China and, you know, some of the Middle East and, um, uh, and, and Africa and, and parts of Latin America showing the, the most wow. potential for growth down the road. So even though Australia didn't have a recession, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I mean, I think it has all these factors come together. I mean, when you have a youthful population that's, you know, producing versus kind of taking, um, you know, from the system. Mm -hmm. um, and, and my argument is that, you know, we are going to have to rethink <coughs> retirement and, and, you know, utilize yeah. the, the potential um, of, of, you know, folks who are older, um, because that can be actually one of our uh, great competitive advantages, yeah, right? Yeah, so, so let's look at the web. Um, the US only accounts for 10% of global internet users right now. Um, 500 million users in uh, India and China, and um, those two countries alone will add 700 million more by 2015. Um, and, and if you look at the implications for revenue, they're going to be creating you know, over 80 billion in commerce, um, you know, access fees and, and different revenue around um, this, this growth. Um, and, you know, when I was at Omidyar investing in, in mobile, it was, it was really fascinating to see how, you know, mobile has really transformed and, and helped create GDP growth. And, and I think um, was it the World Bank study a few years ago showed that every 10 percentage point increase in mobile phone penetration yields an extra 0.8 percentage points of annual economic growth. So there's a direct link. It's that connectivity that's allowed people, and, and there's so many stories, you know, they're farmers that can then access uh, information about weather patterns and um, or, or kind of world uh, prices around different crops, and then they can decide when to, when to sell because they have this increased information and then increase their revenue. Um, you know, we'll talk a little bit about M-Pesa in, in Kenya, which is their mobile money system, but um, it, it's just fascinating that these entrepreneurs that you know, only had like, one business because of M-Pesa and, and you know, ability to transact in different places, um, you know, can run many more businesses uh, and, and not have to be physically present um, uh, everywhere. So it, it, the mobile phone's really been a game changer for all this you know, global growth that we're seeing. Um, and then the other interesting thing is, is that there's no, while there's a lot happening in the US around innovation, um, there are other regions in the world that are leading innovation in different areas. So, you know, if you look at gaming and virtual goods, China um, ha and Japan have, have been uh, uh, have innovated a lot, and, and you know they've created new usage models around those uh, those sectors. And then uh, Indonesia uh, uh, in social networking. I mean, it's an inherently social. Uh, culture uh, where they, they're much more active on, on social networks than uh, in the US. And then I was just, I'll add Jordan since I was just there, um, the Middle East are, are big media consumers because there just aren't as many cinemas and other outlets, so it's online media consumers. Um, and I saw you know, some uh, incredible statistics on, on kind of YouTube 
usage, and, and they're one of the largest in, in the world, that region, around um, you know, YouTube usage. So I, I just think you know, any entrepreneurs or you know, as an investor, when I'm looking at the potential of a particular business, it's important to think about what markets outside, you know, and you guys are not necessarily all in the U.S., but outside of your home markets, <coughs> could this technology be applied to? So I, I talked a little bit about this, but the social, uh, this is a global social network penetration. Um, and the global average is here. And the U.S. is close to the global average. The Philippines, um, so this, the, the, the left axis is the percentage of active online users that are using social networks. Philippines um, and Indonesia are at the top with uh, 78, you know, 75 to 78% um, you know, compared to the U.S., which is just over 50%. And that may have gone up a little bit. Um, but you can, you can just see that a lot of these, you know, Brazil, Russia, India, Mexico, a lot of these markets that have all the growth are also very, very active on the social networks. Um, and, and have they got better broadband penetration or just um, it's all done through mobile devices? Like it's primarily software. mobile. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, uh, it's, I, I think in the U.S., um, it's, I don't know what statistics I said. I know in India, you know, most of it's mobile penetration. Yes. I think Indonesia is the same. Okay. Um, and they just leapfrogged and, and didn't yeah. uh, even, you know, go to the landline network. Yeah. So, um, okay, mobile growth. And I don't know how to do this. It's like, yeah. It plays. I wonder if I can play it on here. It's not that important, but this actually walks through mobile subscriptions per 100 people, and it'll fill in if it actually works. So you can see how, I mean, it's just, you know, from, I think it was Sweden uh, back, uh, you know, in, in, in early uh, 2000s that um, had the highest penetration in the world. And then now you've seen that, I mean, there are several countries that actually have, you know, people have more than one mobile phone um, and uh, just filled in in a, in a matter of a decade. Um, and, and again, this is what's driving so much potential you know, for startups, for investors, and just for economic development in, in general. Um, and then along with this mobile growth, we've also seen incredible uh, growth in, in data, which you know, creates the need for uh, data analytics, and, 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 or you know, the potential around data analytics, too, and, and what we can do with this data. So Cisco uh, releases a, you know, the, the study um, every few years, and you can see that they're projecting um, by 2016 10.8 exabytes per month of data being created on mobile devices alone. Um, and you know, we're just at uh, you know, around 1.3 right now, which is still a lot. But <laughs> Um, and that's an exciting area for me. Um, I mean, we keep hearing about big data, but then it's what's important is you know figuring out you know how to constructively use this data in, in different verticals and uh, and uh, but but it's all there and it's you know hours for the using. Um, so let's move into you know, the three areas that I, I think are uh, particularly interesting right now on a global scale, and one is uh, financial services. Um, start with the U.S. Uh, because we've had such an established banking system here, been very slow to innovate uh, on online banking, on mobile banking. Uh, it's, it's starting to happen. I mean, we're seeing banks finally figure out uh, that they need to, you know, 
have mobile apps and allow people to to deposit checks, et cetera, on, you know, without going physically going to an ATM. But you know, when I was with the New York City Investment Fund, we spent uh, a lot of time with with these large banks, and um, st they were still one. You know, they they were still trying to figure out uh, whether mobile was going to be big, and that was just um, three years ago. Um, <laughs> Now, PayPal has been around, but PayPal is, uh, I'd say, you know, clunky, expensive, uh, ripe to be disrupted. And I'm seeing a lot of startups here that are trying to do that. The problem is we're so fragmented in the U.S. in terms of financial services. Um, you know, Square has been doing well. Um, and um, you know more mobile phones are being shipped with uh, near field communications to do the contactless payments. But again, there hasn't been any kind of widespread adoption there. Um, and then we're seeing you know little bits of innovation around mobile couponing and, and loyalty cards, um, you know, on, on mobile devices. But I do think the next few years, I feel that the banks are finally getting it. Um, in, in this country, uh, it's really the consumers that's been that have been leading the businesses. Terms of, of mobile, um, you know, mobile potential, but um, uh, they're they're getting there. Kenya is just an interesting case study uh, around uh, what can work uh, with mobile payments, and uh, they launched in 2007 by Safaricom. And and what helped is that Safaricom is uh, a, a pretty much a monopoly there, so they mandated, or or they actually had. Uh, the ability to, to distribute uh, or create this uh, platform, whereas, you know, there is, you know, we have several operators in the U.S. and in many countries, and, and so uh, that was one of the keys on why, um, why it took off, and, and then the government was very supportive of, and, and did not, re you know, regulate it or, uh, or actually created supportive legislation around M-Pesa. Um, and, and we're seeing, it started off as just being able to transfer money um, between people. I, I, you know, I've been seeing different applications being built on the platform, savings applications, micro savings applications, um, where you can actually um, uh, renew airtime or buy more airtime through the platform, uh, and remittances. So, so this is... Um Connected people's bills, cell phone bills, or yeah, the cell phone bills, right? And then um, they I actually have a video later if you want to see. It. I didn't include it, but but uh, it'll it walks through what people you know how people interact with these kiosks and can send mm -hmm. money uh, to each other. It's so over four billion dollars of of M money transactions in Kenya, um, which is thirteen percent of the entire GP, GDP has gone through in Pesa. <laughs> Um, and, and the interesting thing is the average value is $24. So it, it's, you know, these microtransactions that are, that are happening. But, but just think of, you know, what is now possible that wasn't before from a business perspective there. Um, and when I was last in Kenya and, you know, I was interviewing people who are using M-Pesa and the kiosks, they just couldn't believe that, you know, in the U.S. nothing like that existed <laughs> because they just think, that the U.S. is so much more innovative. Yeah, the um, joke is that here in Redwood City, they they redid the downtown and they built a new municipal parking meter. Uh -huh. They accept mobile payments, except nobody's able to make mobile payments. <laughs> right. So that was very Well, and then it's also you know when you're when you're traveling to these regions and you have good cell phone coverage and, and, and good broadband coverage on, on you know, mobile networks and you're in the middle of New York or here and it's spotty. So. Um, and then Japan, um, at the other end of the spectrum, so they, they've really innovated around the, uh, and how much? Like, I don't know, you've got plenty of time. Okay. Just we'll go to, you know if we'll go to um, uh, quarter past, so it's okay. a quarter okay. um, And they've really pioneered the use on the near field uh, communication, so the contact len, uh, contactless uh, payments. Um, the reason it's worked so well is that there is that they rolled it out w um, at the, um, the the subway, uh, uh, you know, train uh, entrances. So it, it, it's high volume, quick uh, transactions that it uh, works for. Um, the government played a significant role there, and that's a you know theme we've seen. I mean, even though you know there is. In the U.S., we believe in this 
you know, free market system in a lot of these other countries, what's really health adoption is regulation um, uh, and or support. Um, and, and contactless payments are 40% faster than credit cards and 55% faster than cash. So just the velocity and what's possible if you, you know, start transforming it, creating more revenue for businesses if, you know, retail outlets can start using it. Um, and, um, and, and this uh, average value of the transaction is only $9. So you can see they're using it for, uh, you know, these, these small, um, small transactions, uh, trying to roll it out on a broader scale beyond just transportation. Um, and, you know, in the U.S., they're really trying to push it with retailers, and um, it, we'll see if it catches on or not. But you're, you need to have these readers, which, you know, they it's expensive. In all of the 7-Elevens, all of the yeah. little convenience stores everywhere. Yeah, yeah. In Japan. Yeah. Okay, commerce. Um, so, you know, we, Amazon started here in 94. The U.S. was at the forefront of online commerce. Uh, have a very high average spend here, uh, $1,000. Um, and, and, you know, you guys are, you've been here, you know, all week and know that how much innovation is happening in the commerce space. Uh, you know, I think tablet is going to, to be very interesting um, because it's, I think, made for, you know, browsing and purchasing and, and has a better interface than, you know, a smaller uh, form factor as, as the uh, smartphones. Um, and uh, so this is an area that I'm, you know, really looking at actively investing in. Uh, and the U.S. Um, commerce market is going to continue to grow. I mean, you know, people have money here. It's, it's uh, going to be uh, continue to be a big market. Um, I, I think there needs to be a lot more innovation on, you know, purchasing on, on mobile platforms. That's still, you know, in, on the mobile sites, you have to go through like 10 or 15 <laughs> screens before you can actually check out. So, um, you know, what, what Amazon did with the one-click purchase. And so I think, you know, all of that will evolve on, on, on the mobile side. Um, and then, you know, the social element, um, I think it's still to be determined whether that creates more friction or actually helps in, in commerce. And there's just so much experimentation happening right now. Um, so China, I mean, huge, huge, uh, you know, uh, growing middle class there. Uh, E-commerce spending expected to increase uh, from 75 billion to 315 billion in just five years. Um, and uh, you know, their average spend is expected to be almost the same as what the U.S. is right now. Um, and their uh, large, you know, commerce site, there are 48,000 items sold every minute right now. And, and part of this is because there are not as many kind of bricks and mortar uh, outlets, uh, or they're harder to get to in, you know, outside of the, the main cities. And the traffic is, is um, an impediment, too. So people just find it more comfortable to, to um, purchase online. Um, they, and this is like a cultural difference, and, and, and you know, this will exist in different, I'm, I'm just using China as an example, but these are things to think about. Um, if they're the most likely in the world to check product recommendations on social networking sites. So um, they're, they, tr they don't trust independent parties. They're going to trust their friends or, 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 or certain folks that have made recommendations versus independent sites. Um, and, and a lot of this uh, spend is on, on mobile devices. So Brazil is another uh, market where there's a, a huge growing uh, middle class, uh, and so an area, you know, a region that I'm very interested in, especially as it relates to commerce. Um, and they've been innovating around, uh, I mean, there's a mobile commerce and online commerce, but also kind of in-store experiences, which I think are just starting to come to the U.S. a little bit more. But you know, these interactive dressing rooms um, and, you know, where people can take pictures and, and send uh, off uh, uh, texts and photos of social networks. And then the retailers are actually collecting all this data. And, and so, you know, I'm not saying this is, uh, broadly implemented there, but uh, but there's just it's a very you know social people like to shop there, and I think there's still that very much bricks and mortar 
um, you know, desire to be out shopping versus China, and, and so they're innovating around that in-store experience, um, which um, you know, uh, uh, the U.S. Is, is trying to do too, is kind of bridge that compete against just a pure online presence. Um, so, uh, and mobile, uh, there's a the last bullet says that our music takes two months to sell online, what it does in one day in mobile. So. Um, you know, if you're looking at just the online, out of store experience, mobile is, is where people are buying there. Let's talk about healthcare. Um, this aging population in a lot of these regions in the world creates opportunity around uh, healthcare, and, and we're seeing that in the US, and this is another area, uh, investment area, that I am uh, looking at very closely. Um, by 2050, 20% of the U.S. population will be above the age of 65. Um, and so there's a need for you know, at-home monitoring systems, and, uh, and there's been more focus on preventative health care. Of, of not, you know, in the U.S., we've been primarily focused on just treating you know, once there's a problem and not enough on the prevention. But with this kind of aging population and the health challenges that can come with it, there's more focus on how do we uh, you know, predict what's going to, you know, wh what we're susceptible to in terms of disease later on in life. And then that's created this opportunity around quantitative self, quantified self, where, um, you know, we have the Fitbits. Do you know, are you familiar with the Fitbits that track, um, you know, how many steps you take? And you can input all this data about you. You can sequence, uh, you know, there's a, the DNA uh, uh, typing that 23andMe is doing and collect all that data and then figure out what you personally need to do uh, to, uh, to take care of yourself. Um, and, um, and then there's the mobile, you know, more doctors are using mobile devices because we're seeing, you know, gener a generation of, of, uh, of uh, doctors that grew up with technology which wasn't the case before. So it's much easier to even create applications that doctors and hospitals use. Um, and, um, and so they're remote, like ECGs. I mean, there's a picture of that, uh, of this x-ray um, uh, app on a mobile phone. Um, and, and so I, you know, I think there's a lot in the US that's going to happen in this space over, over the coming years. We're just in the beginning here. Um, India is very interesting because they have so few doctors there uh, compared to the population. Um, and uh, so they have pioneered this like mobile, uh, uh, these mobile uh, bands that, that go around treating people but have these kind of mobile devices and, and that are low cost uh, that can travel um, and like pacemakers and x-ray machines. Um, uh, these low-cost infant warmers, these um, you know these incubators that actually um, you know cost like a tenth of what they do in the U.S. but are just as effective. Um, uh, I looked at a dial-a-doctor service, which you know ha could be implemented here in the U.S. as healthcare costs go up, right? Where um, there's you know you pay by phone call or you take you know have a subscription of being able to contact doctors uh, remotely. Um, They've also done a lot around paperless records. Uh, so I, um, I, I, I track India very closely because I think some of these innovations happening there can be transferred over to the US. And then Nigeria and Ghana, when I was at Omidyar, I looked at this company called M Pedigree, which um, is targeting counterfeit pharmaceuticals by um, uh, having codes that uh, and you have to, you have to uh, partner with pharmaceutical companies with their codes on the medications that then you uh, scan into your phone and it'll tell you immediately whether it's a counterfeit or, or not. And this is a huge problem in emerging markets. And as more and more uh, pharmaceuticals are, are, are uh, manufactured in these emerging markets, it's going to become more of a global problem. So, um, so they're building this huge pharmaceutical uh, database of uh, and, and, and they're actually talking to companies in the U.S. now to, to implement it. Yeah. 
So, um, you know, the conclusion here is it, it's just, um, and again, I'm talking to a very international audience, I don't really need to tell you this, but, um, you know, it, it's really about uh, not focusing too much on a particular region or, or thinking about how technologies, you know, can be applied um, in, in different regions in different ways. So you can take one technology and, and just, you know, think about all the potential markets that it could uh, could be applied. Um, and uh, I think we're just at the beginning of this. And, and I uh, really would like to see more cross-border collaboration among startups, amongst investors. And, and, um, and, and I, I think, you know, any startup that isn't paying attention to global markets is, is not going to realize uh, their, their full potential. And it's, it's, a, it's harder to do because there are cultural differences um, and, but it, it's um, the kind of growth that we're seeing around the world um, and the, the startups that are able to you know, take advantage of that have just done you know, so much better and multiplied their, their revenue streams and potential. So um, 